So let's talk a little bit about questioning and inquiry. You mentioned in the pre-chat that you might write another book um, about that and um, some examples about um, asking good questions in uh, classrooms. Yeah, well, it's interesting, this journey of questioning and inquiry, and there's a lot of people speaking in this space. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of books out there and a lot of great books out there. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things I realized actually in this journey with questioning is I wrote this book called Now That's a Good Question. And in, in the book, I introduce eight different types of questions that we can pose and present to our students that will have them demonstrate what Karen has called cognitive rigor, demonstrating different levels of thinking, understanding, using depth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. What I found really fascinating is how teachers struggle to come up with questions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not anyone's fault with that. And the majority of teachers with it, questioning is uncomfortable because mm -hmm. with when I ask you a question, you're expected to give me an answer. And if you say, I don't know, it's often frowned upon. And it's okay to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. We need to allow kids to say, I don't know, because that is the doorway to inquiry, the doorway to understanding. Um, what we need to also have them communicate with us and say what it is that they don't know. And you can't just let them get away and say, I don't know. Like when I basically mm -hmm. used to ask a question in my class, the kids would go, oh no. And I say, I don't expect you to. We're, that's what you're going to find out. This is the instructional focus. If you don't know by the end of the week, then I have a problem because I'm mm -hmm. the teacher. I have to own it. I have to help them make sure that they get to learn that. So there's a lot out there with questioning. And I wrote, now that's a good question, actually in response and support of essential questions, which is a big thing we've been using for years. The great work of Jay McTighe and Grant Wiggins. Um, but there was a lot of confusion about what, an essential question is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, Jay uh, McTighe and Grant Wiggins says it's, you know, something you can't just answer with a simple yes or no. It's very, very deep. It's very profound. Uh, Grant Wiggins is very influenced by Ted Sizer, who came up with that with the essential schools, where he talks about it's the core ideas and during understandings of the subject. And then you have John Larmer coming in with project-based learning, who talks about the driving question. So what I did with it was that I said, there's four different types of essential questions. Mm -hmm. There's universal, those big thematic questions, like what is life? The overarching addresses the anchor standards of a core content area or any content area that can be asked over and over again at any grade level. And the topical is about the unit you're teaching and the driving engages you in an authentic learning experience where you can develop your talents and your thinking and your expertise. But what I'm seeing a lot is that teachers are actually struggling to think and, 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 and phrase in the form of a question. And if you look at question stems out there or sample question stems, they'll say like, determine what, or explain how, or mm -hmm. describe what. Okay, that's not a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, if it makes you sound like Arlie Emery in Full Metal Jacket, or when <laughs> he's the soldier in um, a Toy Story, you're not asking a question. Would you agree to disagree to say, for the most part, that teachers speak mostly in making declarations because we give the information mm -hmm. and, and giving directions because we say, do this. We need to shift that and make it with questioning. And what I came up with, I came up with a concept I call inquiring minds. So my first question is what I call the hook. Mm -hmm. And that hook piques your curiosity and interest. So I can ask you something as simple as, who's the first president of the United States? And you would tell me. George Washington. And I'd say, what do you mean? Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, how do you know that he's the first president of the United okay. States? And then I'd say, okay. And, and what it does is it introduces the kids that they can go look it up. And if they look it up, they'll start seeing mentions of a guy named John Hansen, who mm -hmm. was the first president appointed under the Articles of Confederation. He didn't have the same power, but he did have a title called president. So that leads into the deeper question uh, for the standard, how did the Art of Confederation, uh, the failures of Art of Confederation lead to the writing of the US Constitution? That's an actual standard. Understand how um, the Art of Confederation led to the writing of the US Constitution. Mm -hmm. I took that the question. An argumentative for deep would be, should George Washington continue to be credited as the first president of the United States, mm -hmm. or should we acknowledge the other eight who were appointed under the Art of Confederation? And there's no correct answer, but that's an argument you can do. And then the deep, sorry, the um, expertise question is, I'm gonna give you a scenario situation 
where the descendants of these eight presidents appointed under Carter, Carter his federation want the president to pass an executive order to acknowledge their ancestors. Mm -hmm. Here's five different roles. You're the lobbyist who has to come up with the argument for it. How would you do that? You're mm -hmm. the congressperson who's against it. How would you come up with an argument against it? You're the, um, the mediator who comes up with a compromise. What kind of compromise do you come up with? You're the PR person to get it out there to say, um, there are eight presidents before George Washington. How would you get that out there? What kind of media campaign can you come up with? You're the citizen who thinks it's a waste of time. What kind of letter can you write to the paper? So again, I call it inquiring minds. And then I'd ask the kids, well, what is the first things you don't know and understand? They might say, well, what were the Arts of Federation? That's the foundational level. Mm -hmm. So it comes from them using QFT. So what I'm hoping to do with my next book is to teach how to teach and learn with good questions, because that's kind of what my PD has evolved into. Like when I used to first do PD, I used to come to your school armed with my book and my cognitive rigor question framework and go, okay, everybody, these are the eight types of questions we can ask. Here's mm -hmm. some of my curricular examples. Okay, now you create some. And it was a struggle. So it went to then, okay, I need to help teachers and guide teachers to shift from making declarations and giving directions to asking questions. And then from there, it became more of how I differentiate the different ways you can rephrase statements and directives into questions. And it really actually became a philosophy because my philosophy with PD is, why is it we differentiate instruction, but we don't differentiate professional development? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when I do PD, I feel like that's my role is that I need to go find out what will work for you. So it's mm -hmm. kind of walking your talk when you talk about differentiation, inquiry, and such. So that might be the sequel to now that's a good question. Or I might write another DOK book. There's so many different things you can do to explore that. But mm -hmm. right now, I'm really jazzed about this DOK book. It's the only one that's out there that really explicitly talks about DOK. Mm -hmm. um, other books mention it. Other books reference it. Unfortunately, they reference a lot of times what's already been said or they use the wheel. Um, this is going to be a real deep dive into DOK and um, calling it de deconstructing depth of knowledge. We had to get Norman Webb's permission and he approved it. And, um, you know, I really hope, you know, I do him justice with his research. It's, it's kind of like DOK 3.0 because if he mm -hmm. did it for Lyman studies and Karen has did it as a measure of cognitive rigor, I turned it into a method and model for deeper teaching and learning. And I encourage anybody else to take this framework and really do something innovative with it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot to learn, I think, uh, about both inquiry, questioning, and depth of knowledge. Um, can people find you uh, promoting the book at different conferences, or do you have some uh, planned, um, like, just book signings or any of that going on in the fall? Well, the book is coming out in October. Um, I am speaking at mostly a lot of it right now because the conferences are not uh, starting up yet. I will be mm -hmm. at the AMLE uh, Middle Level Conference presenting mm -hmm. Inquiring Minds in November. Uh, most of what I'm doing is working with schools and districts uh, closely um, at the uh, site or at the district level. Mm -hmm. But if you want to keep in touch with me, you can contact me at www.maverick, no season maverick, M A V E R I K, education.com. Uh, that's the name of my company. I named it after my daughters, Mass and Avery and Amanda. Mm -hmm. And as a child of the age, you probably guess what my favorite movie is. <laughs> so, Top Gun. I can't believe I got to wait another year for that sequel to come out. I've been waiting 36 oh, yeah. years. I know. <laughs> uh, so, again, you can go to my website, Maverick Education, M A V E R I K, or email me at eric at maverickeducation.com. Or um, I'm going to try to organize and create some online courses. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, you know, I'll be doing some more promotion about the book, where that's kind of like in the planning stage right now. By the time this comes out, you might see things hopefully because um, I love presenting. I love working with teachers. And I really can't wait actually to get back out there on the road and be live and in person. I know some people have said, hey, this transition to virtual remote this is really good. But man, I want to get out of my yeah. chair. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I want to, I mean, well. it's funny. I'll get reviews like, you know, wow, that was a good presentation. I said, yeah, you see what it's like when I'm standing up on a stage. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's so. It's a different feel. <laughs> so, yeah. So, again, just keep, you know, keep alert at the website. Um, the link for uh, the um, pre-orders and actually be probably or out by the time this comes out. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be available through solutiontree.com. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, this new adventure in education. I hope we all look at it and treat it that way because, the changes in education are not going to come from the top. They're going to come from the classroom and it's going to grow like a seed. 
Well, out of everything we talked about today on the podcast, what's one thing in particular you'd like listeners to remember? One of my big things, two, actually two of my big things is that um, always ask yourself what if mm-hmm. with a positive thing. Like for example, what if um, we don't call it learning loss, we call it unfinished business, mm-hmm. okay? So you take off what if, you'll have your mantra. Mm-hmm. So make that shift to what if. The other thing I also really want to get out there and, and really it's something to wrap your heads around is that tragedy can be temporary. Yeah. And it is your, you decide how the story wants to end. If you don't ask, why does this always happen to me? Because everything is happening to you for a purpose and a reason. Mm-hmm. And you can basically control how the story ends, mm-hmm. you know? And the other thing is, is that it may not be immediate. Um, it may not be in five minutes today, tomorrow, but I do believe that we are in charge of our own destinies. So I really hope that people, if you want the change to happen in education, you make the change. Like we, like Rick calls the company pushing boundaries, push the boundaries, but understand that if you want to make an omelet, you got to break some eggs. And mm-hmm. some people don't like eggs to break. So <laughs> that's kind of my thing. Shift your focus to what if, and also realize that tragedy can be temporary and you decide how the story ends. Oh, those are great words to live by. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the Out of the Trenches podcast today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate this opportunity.